the Daily Gold Podcast, covering precious metals, the junior mining sector, and global capital markets for intelligent investors. Now, here is your host, Jordan Roy Byrne. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Daily Gold Podcast. With us today, great guest, as always, Vince Lancey, newly Professor Vince Lancey. He writes the gold fix on Substack. He's also with Echo Bay Futures. Vince, uh, let's let's just get right into it. First thing I want to ask you about, open interest. So I was checking the COT data yesterday. Open interest back at a five-year low. I mean, barely above 400,000 contracts. And other than one or two, I mean, other than two weeks, it would be at a seven-year low. Uh, I, 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 Two-part question. First of all, explain to us, what is open interest, its general importance? And secondly, what does this mean for the gold market right now? Oh, okay. That's that's okay, that's well put. Um, well asked, I should say. Okay, um, to start with current events, right? Every not everyone, but you're starting to see discussion of open interest. It started about three or four months ago when the banks were saying open interest is low, and they were using it as a as a, this is going to answer your question about you know what is it generally, the implicit point that banks were making was open interest is low, meaning there's not a lot of investor participation buying it from the long side, and when that investor participation comes, when there's interest in it, you know like buying the stock, then it will grow, and as the open interest grows, generally speaking, that's a sign that people are invested in something. And if they're invested in something, then generally speaking, uh, that will make the price go up. So it's a matter of, it's a chicken and egg issue uh, at its core, but the concept of open interest in gold, I'm not talking about every commodity or every asset out there, but the contrast of the comment on open interest is, is that if open interest is low in a vacuum, and you don't have any other information on that, then open interest is low. Nobody wants to play. Nobody is thinking about the market. If open interest is stupidly high, extremely high, then they're already invested and you really are a little bit concerned about them changing their mind. So you want to see the market moving higher with open interest from a low area moving towards a high area. It's not so much how big open interest is, it's the, it's the direction of it. But let's face it, as you noted, open interest at historic lows implies that either Nobody cares about gold, right? Because the open interest is low, or or uh, the gold market will move decidedly higher once people start caring about it again. So the answer is a combination of, the, of those two things. Obviously, look at the price that we're at, and you know that it's they may they whoever they are on the on the speculative or investment side may not care about gold, and the open interest is low as a result of that. But they also uh, have driven the price of gold to over two thousand dollars. So open interest matters uh, in a normal market because it shows the signs of of uh, the cycles of interest. You know, we buy it. If you're looking at it as a trader, we buy it when the when the new future is listed, and then we sell it when the future expires. And the open interest will fluctuate; it'll breathe uh, like any uh, other uh, cyclical asset. The problem now is. And I don't see it as a problem. I see it as an opportunity. The problem now is that the open interest is low, and it seems like it may also be stagnating. Uh, that's not a problem for gold people. That's a problem for banks that make money off of gold people. Okay. Um, yeah. Before we before we get into the second question, I'm thinking of a, a follow up, or do you want to go right to my general? Oh question? no, no. Yeah, ask me whatever you want. Whatever. Let's keep it flowing. It's okay. fine. Yeah. Um, so it, it so open interest i mean it, it's really just where we where we're at with gold now it's really just a condition of the market like it's not necessarily like by itself it's not a catalyst no i mean you're you're right exactly you're a technician you know and 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 you know that looking at one indicator uh without looking at it in context of other indicators uh is a problem and, and you know open interest is a technical indicator and low open interest means if you're looking at it outside the technical indicator uh, domain for a second. Low open interest means there's not a lot of interest in the market in the futures. 
Doesn't mean there's not a lot of interest in the metal, but there's not a lot of interest in the venue, the COMEX venue, which is starting to make a lot of sense. Now, now, uh, if you look at it that way, you could say either the product stinks. Well, look at the open interest and then look at the price. To your point, well, with open interest this low, you would think price would be this low from a lack of demand, you know, but it's not happening that way. Then if you go into, if you if you take it from the from the big picture and you start to zoom in a little bit, you realize that, you know, could it be because the COMEX is in trouble and, you know, paranoid, you know, uh, conspiracy theorist, of which I happen to be one, will, uh, will tell you yes, and I'll say to you, uh, it's the contract that's broken, not the exchange. But that's another conversation. The the the. But when you zoom into the technical level, as you implied, looking at open interest in and of itself means nothing. Looking at open interest in relationship to two things at the basic level, open interest versus previous open interest. So in this case, we've already done that. It's very low. And open interest versus price. And if you look at that, you'd say, well, uh, that correlation, uh, that relationship seems to be broken as well. And so that's because this market, the price of this market is reflecting interest in the market. The open interest, however, is not reflecting American interest in the product. That's what's going on. Okay. Yeah, I, I know that's a good segue for what we're going to talk about next, but just... When, uh, you know, I was thinking of things we could discuss for the interview, and it's actually something I've just been thinking about for the last couple of weeks or even the last couple of months. Well, actually, more, more so just very recently. Just so I'm looking, we're looking at the stock market. It's making new highs. It's, it's broken out. You know, gold, gold divided by the stock market's been going down. It's in the toilet. It's at a two year low. How the hell, why the hell? Is gold holding above two thousand dollars an ounce? Like, why is this happening? Well, I, I don't, the, I don't yeah. understand it. Yeah. Well, well. First of all, yeah, you're you're one of the few guys that was talking about that the gold S and P relationship. Remember, maybe six months ago, you said the gold S and P relationship does not look good, and you were implying that it doesn't. It looks either bullish for the stock market or bearish for gold. And uh, that was something that you had said to me. And obviously, it wasn't bearish for gold. That's what we're talking about now. But it was bullish for the stock market. You, I remember you, we, we were talking about that from a technical point of view. You were like, ah, stock-gold relationship looks very bad for gold. Anyway, on a relative basis. Um, getting right to your question about above 2000. First of all, let's let's go back a little bit. In, in November of last year, uh, you know, during one of our conversations, we were talking about the end of the month close, the November 30th close, and you were saying 2009-20 was a big number. The point being that uh, 2000 isn't that important anymore. Closing a month above 2000 or spe specifically above 2009 spot 20 uh, would be very significant. And we got that. And, uh, and since then, the market has held above 2000 every week for... 14 weeks, I believe I noted uh, in, in an article yesterday. Um, so the question is why, right? If everybody wants stocks, right? If 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 the world is risk on, you know, why is gold firm? Uh, the first reaction that you're going to get from all the macro analysts, and, and, you know, I can play macro as good as anyone. And the macro answer goes like this. Well, they're anticipating the Fed's going to be easing Jordan. And if they're anticipating the Fed's going to be easing, that's going to be bullish for gold. Well, that, that that may be true. But the Fed just said they're not going to be easing. You know, they implied that. And if they are going to ease, they're kicking it down the road. Stocks continue to rally despite that, right? Gold continues to be a safe haven despite tight monetary policy. How, how does that happen? Well, uh, uh, to, to, to put a very, to put it in a very blunt phrase, you know, you know, why is gold staying above 2000 despite low open interest? Why is gold staying above 2000 despite an incredibly strong risk on stock market? Well, the answer is they want the gold. That's what's going on. It comes down to one thing. They want the gold. And who is they? Who are we talking about <laughs> here? Oh, my God. The evil partners. Now, the former trade partners of the United States want the gold. Countries that are in line with the BRICS ideologically and to a lesser extent, but very rarely current trade partners of the United States and the West, like Germany, they want the gold. 
They want the gold. They need the gold. They want the gold. And so they're they're buying this through the. I mean, they're, well, they're not buying it through the futures market. I mean, what what are the mechanics? How does this keep the price above two thousand? Right, right. What's how does that manifest? Um, well, there, you know, those people who want the physical gold, they don't want uh, the futures. They want the physical gold, and you don't buy the physical gold on on the futures exchange. You buy the physical gold in, let's say, and I'm simplifying it, but this is how it works. You buy it on the LBMA. You buy it in the spot market. You buy it in private over-the-counter transactions. And the reason that filters into the exchange price is because the price is a transparent tool. And you use that price to determine your deal. So you and I are big banks. We're central banks. And I'm going to buy some gold from you. Well, we use the COMEX pricing mechanism to determine our deals. Do we trade on the COMEX? No. We don't trade on the COMEX. We trade between each other. So the over-the-counter market, as it's called, has grown uh, precipitously back to where it used to be over the past year to two years. Simultaneously, any bullion bank or anyone who's a counterparty to these trades outside of you and I as central banks, those two people, let's say it's a, a bank that's they're trading with and that bank needs to um uh, needs to hedge off the risk well that risk will go into the comex and the comex market will move higher or lower depending on that depending on that trade that transaction uh but it doesn't last long because these hedges get unwound when the gold's delivered and so the open interest will continually gravitate lower as the as the if i'm right as the metal continually leaves the COMEX vault. And that's all part of Basel three as well. Does that, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, a little bit. So, I mean, is there, is there like a, a, a way we can, when you say they want the goal, I mean, all that demand, is there a way to track that or is it just kind of, I mean, the, the over the counter more, is that just too opaque? I mean, is there actually data where you can, I mean, well, I know that there's, you know, people talk about physical demand in China and, but, uh, I mean, is, is there, can you actually, no, want, you quanti saying. can you quantify that demand in any way? Well, I mean, it, it's, it's, there's like a three part answer to that and, and they'll be short, right? The first part is, the first answer is no, you cannot in near real time understand that. Number two, yes, you can see that rather regularly if you assemble the data from various organizations showing the flows of gold from the east to the west. An example of that would be, a recent example of that would be um, if you look at LBMA, the imports of gold from the LBMA were very large, and most of that came from the United States last year. And the exports from the LBMA, which means metal that was physically delivered, uh, uh, from the LBMA after being received by, let's say, the United States. Most of that went to China. So you will see evidence confirming that after the fact. Now, that's not any help if you're trading short term, but that's a very big picture trend that's not going away. So, so I guess what I'm saying is there's no way for us to see that uh, on a, on a real time or near real time basis. Um, statistically like looking at empirical evidence there are two ways to see that and one is to to pay attention to the flows and the other is to you know use uh what you know about the flows to to uh hopefully uh use technicals to help it in that way i mean look the reason i keep saying you know they want the gold is because they don't trust the united states let alone most of the world anymore and so they're not going to tell us when they're buying the gold and when they're selling the gold you know they they need to see the gold though they want it you know one of the things we used to look at was financialization and correlations you know financialization and correlations mattered as long as nothing bigger was going on and you know correlations are excuses to execute trades and we're no longer looking at those being the reasons to do trades anymore they want the gold china wants the gold the BRICS want the gold uh I'm telling you that that's going to continue to happen because the world has split in two and and now you can no longer accept an IOU. See, the gold that used to be in the COMEX used to be just fine sitting in the COMEX and you would give someone an IOU for it and you give someone the cash for it. But now 
they want physically the gold to come home to them. They want to see it because they no longer trust the West uh, with their with their goods. You know, not your not your. You know, if, if you don't have it in your possession, it's not yours. Has so, yeah, has someone done a, a dumb and dumber meme on this yet? Where you know, where they st- they spend the guy's money from the briefcase and they put it all back, and Jim Carrey's like, "Those are IOU, <laughs> those are IOUs, those are well, those are as good." <laughs> or does that not make any good, sense yeah. in this aspect? No, no, it it totally makes sense. Um, uh, uh, in fact, in fact, I'll give you an example of that happening. In 2016, 2017, Germany said, "We want the gold. Give us our gold back," and the United States said, "Okay." Now, I'm dramatizing, but the United States said, sure, it'll take some time. Took a couple of years, a year at least. Okay, why did it take so long? Well, ostensibly because a lot of the gold was uh, old and it had to be re-refined to be brought up to spec. It was grandfathered in from old uh, smelting styles. Uh, but the real reason is they had to get it together. You know, the gold is, you know, being double counted probably. I mean, I'm not accusing anyone of that, but I'm sure that's, you, know, you have to source it. You have to find it. So uh, to say that IOUs have been accepted in the past, we've got your gold. I swear I've got your gold. You know, we'll give you the money for it because we print the money. But the gold, we have to go find the gold. So just take the money. You want the gold tomorrow? What if I gave you 5% on your money? What if I gave you 10% on your money? Then you wouldn't want the gold. Nowadays, it's like, I don't care about the percent. I need the gold because I don't want your treasuries anymore. That's what's going on. Okay, yeah, two, I just two thoughts slash questions on that. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask earlier is that's basically all these parties they're getting out of, well, actually three thought that all these parties they're getting out of treasuries and, uh, you know, going into gold, obviously. But like central, I mean, central banks are, we were talking about they, I mean, that this is central banks make up a huge percentage of what we're talking about right yes or am i oh yeah yeah they're they're they're, they're the ones who want the gold i mean you know uh, um but i, I do have what you know one other follow-up if you want to touch on that rather than mm-hmm. central banks well yeah the central banks they're the buyers right they're the ones who who need it you know uh i mean are you asking me you know specifically who and how i mean the central banks they need to replace. See, we we were all told, every central bank was told, and every central bank believed, and every central bank told its people, every government told its people that you don't need the gold, right? You were told you don't need the gold because gold's not money anymore. Gold's a thing. And this is about central banks, right? Since gold can't be destroyed, we'll lend you the money that you want to use from the gold. Leave the gold where it is. You don't need it. We'll give you the money. And and that way, you know, it's as good as gold. And gold became something that was traded but never used. And since it wasn't being used technically monetarily anymore, well, you didn't want the gold, right? Central banks didn't want the gold. They trusted you with it. You wanted the money that the gold could get you. You wanted the buying power of the gold. You wanted the cash. You wanted the currency, right? Now, no one's going to be using gold as a currency uh, anytime soon or ever, I think. But, you know, Fast forward post COVID and the world for multiple reasons. And this is why central bankers are wanting the gold now. They've been thinking about this for a long time. Uh, They meaning everyone but the United States. And the world decides, you know what? We don't want treasuries anymore. Now they do want treasuries, but we don't want as many treasuries anymore. We want our gold back. Well, why would they want their gold? Well, staying with China, for example, When I say China, think of anyone in that sphere of influence. But China seeks to replace a portion of their treasuries with gold, not as a currency, but as a store of value. You know, it's a store of value. You're not going to go around, you know, using uh, Chinese um, uh, tails. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. Or gold coins to buy your dim sum. Uh, Why do they not want U.S. treasuries is the question that you're really asking if, 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 we're wondering why central banks won't gold. That's the question. Why do they not want U.S. Treasuries? And and you know, that's because of the stability. You know, they they own Treasuries before because they were the strongest guarantee of anything on earth that they will be as they say they are a year, two years, five years, ten years from now. 
And and you and I have had this conversation before. Well, gold does that as well. Uh, however, gold's not as liquid as treasuries. Gold's not as deep as treasuries. Gold doesn't generate interest, and it's cumbersome. So how do we make those treasuries even more appealing? Well, over the years, we've given them interest. We've given them reasons to trust us. You know, uh, we've hedged their debasement, and and that assured them to keep their money in treasuries. So what changed? Well, what changed is these countries, starting with Russia and China, no longer feel that the rate given, the interest rate given on the treasuries is commensurate with the debasement risks to the dollar. The confiscation risks, as evidenced during the beginning of the Ukraine war, right? Russia had their money taken from them, their treasuries, I should say, and with other sanctions. And the growing domestic instability of the U.S. is demonstrating that. So they can no longer, in good conscience, buy treasuries. So now the question is, if we don't trust the United States and its treasury market as much as we used to, what are we going to replace it with? What is perfect as a store of value has no loyalty or ability to be literally created by man. What is agreeable with every other country in the world and what do we all have some of and already accept? And that's gold. And so they said, you know what? <clears throat> we may not love gold. Well, they probably do. But we may not love gold, but we certainly don't like treasuries anymore. And we're going to put our money in gold now because gold doesn't lie. That's the reason that they want gold. And, and that's the reason that it's the central bankers buying the gold. And by the way, it doesn't stop with central bankers, Jordan. It goes from central bankers to sovereign wealth funds. It goes to domestic funds. It goes to it goes to investment funds like Elliott Management that are buying mining assets. It goes to Drunken Miller that's buying Newmont. Now, I'm not saying that those are good investments. I am saying that everyone wants either the gold or some way to create the gold. And, and that's why central banks want it. And they're going to keep buying it because ultimately... Ultimately, we are having a reset. It's just not happening overnight. It's happening over a slow, long uh, process. And we're in that process right now. Okay, yeah, important follow-up to that. I mean, the, the the precursor to the bull market in the 70s, I mean, we, we had to go off the gold standard because France and other kinds, I mean, it's predominantly France, right, who was saying, give us, like, they, they wanted, they were turning in their dollar, yeah, they were turning in their dollars for gold, you know, because they saw they saw that inflation was really ramping up. Right. And, well, well, yeah, and, that's exactly it. I mean, I'm not. France was the key moment, the second to last key, the first to last key moment, and then the very last was Britain. But France was the public announcement that we're cheating. Absolutely, yeah. So it's, uh, I mean, I'm not saying it's the exact same thing, but it's very, now obviously the, the gold market, it, it's it's much bigger, you know, there's more, because then it was really just, it was just governments basically. But now, so now the market is much bigger, but it seems, it's, it's kind of, it, not kind of, I mean, it's very similar. No, it's the same thing, Jordan. You're absolutely right. It's the same thing. Partners disagree on how, the person handling their gold or handling the economy is managing the economy. And so that partner back then it was France and then England said, you know what? We want the gold. And so the U S said, okay, we'll give it to you. And then the U S said, no one else we're done. And we were in a position of strength. So we could say the dollar is King and you're not going anywhere. Uh, we still have the goal, but now you just have to trust us. Now, fast forward to today, your parallel is actually almost perfect. Uh, another portion of the world is saying we want the gold. We don't trust uh, this arrangement that we have. Send it to us. So instead of a France, instead of a French battleship or whatever it was, a cruiser that parked itself off the East Coast waiting for the gold, uh, you have uh, Chinese traders uh, taking delivery of gold through the LBMA, from the U.S., using the COMEX to the LBMA to the Shanghai Exchange as as their as their skip land uh, bounce, so to speak. So yeah, there you know that's actually a good point. I think people should be realize that that ideologically, what happened in 1970, what happened that caused us to go off the gold standard in 1971, 
is the reason that they're pulling their gold back again in 2024. And ironically, or perhaps paradoxically, you're going to see the world go back to some sort of a gold standard in reaction to enough countries not just wanting their gold, but not trusting the dollar anymore. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I know we're going to get into technicals, but this is, yeah, this is like, well, this is even more than a 30,000 foot view of, because I agree with you. I think just mathematically, gold will have to be part of whatever the new system is. Because if you look at how gold is traded, like if you're thinking, if you're just looking at, you know, the last 100 years, so we, we, we go off the gold, we're going to paper money. And then the, the problem then is how do you stop it? So, you know, gold, it just gold goes parabolic. And then we're able to raise rates and stop it. So then it comes back down. But then it slowly, steadily, you know, decades later, it's slow and steady. It it rises up, you know, above 850 or 880, makes a new high. You know, then then we've had, you know, 2011 to 2015, the bear market where it kind of retested that old high, but not really because it bottomed at 1040 and, and not at 900. And so now it's recovering and it hasn't broken out yet. But at that, like, if you're just thinking about it from a historical point of view, it went up once, had a big correction, went up again. Now it corrected and kind of retested. Like this next leg, like, there's nothing that can stop that. Once it gets going, I mean, there it stops when they, basically when they say, okay, we're going to have to, gold's going to have to be part of the new system. Like, right, it's, act- it's actually the correlation. There's nothing, there's nothing like it's it stops with a new monetary system. Like that's what it has to stop with. Yeah, I mean, you're right. If you look, you know, your comments are are technical, but they they overlap nicely with what's happened since 1971. Gold spiked because they probably were caught flat footed on letting it float price wise. And at the same time, uh, they thought they probably had it under control, 1971, 1972, and then the price starts to go up and they create futures and the futures get out of control and then they put a cap on that. And 2000, and the market just kind of like appreciating slowly under everyone's radar. And in 2011, to your next your next break point, that was the Grexit crisis. That was, you know, that was um, a big problem for Europe. And, you know, gold had a big spike, but they got a lid on it again. You know, they meaning, when I say they, I mean the market forces. There are people that involved in they. But market forces said, hey, this is appreciating too fast. And the bear market, you know, things were shown to be under control again. You know, 2011, 2015, the euro healed. There were no major wars. And so you have that bear market that you're saying, and it doesn't pull back technically to the point where it would kill the whole market. And now we start, you know, uh, growing again, and I think you know it got out of control, you know, at various little points. Uh, but it, they cap it because they're a lot better at this now, right? They're not going to like. I don't think they're going to let it. This is my opinion, right? I don't think they're going to let it do what it did in 1979. I mean, it's going to go to. You're going to have that kind of a percentage move, but it's probably going to be. You know, if it happens again, it's either going to be so fast that if you blink, you'll miss it because they'll be like. Like somebody went to the bathroom and they forgot to press the button at the uh, at the Fed, you know, <laughs> right, right, right. Or, or more likely, if it does happen, that's a sign that we've lost complete control. And then you you go from this soft orderly reset to a hard reset. So yeah, I think it's I think it has to happen, and I think it is going to happen. And I think your comment about your statement about, uh, you know, you made a very strong statement. It's like you know, uh, there's nothing that's going to stop this, and the answer is. The answer is, you know, there is nothing that can stop it. The world is slowly, and I'm not being hyperbolic here, the world is slowly waking up to the fact that there are a shit ton too many dollars out there, and there's no place that wants to hold on to them anymore, or less of a place, right? And those dollars, it's a race. This is the race for gold now. The race is, the Fed, look at the Federal Reserve as a big vacuum cleaner right now. The Federal Reserve, as these dollars all over the world are being orphaned, we don't need them anymore. We're buying our we're buying our oil in yuan. You know, we're buying our pistachios in renminbi. Whatever you want to, whatever you want to buy them in, right? We're using our local currencies for deals. We no longer need dollars, you know, to buy our Big Macs in in Shanghai. Uh, We're going to use other currency. Well, the Fed hits the vacuum cleaner, and we're sucking the dollars back so they don't float around out there and get parked 
in gold and get parked in silver. And so we're sucking these dollars off the market. And if we pull these dollars off the market too hard, we cause a depression in the West. You need dollars to function. You're still on a dollar standard. And that's why Europe suffers more than we do. They're more dependent on dollars because, well, the euro is a piece of shit. Excuse my French. But but um, uh, they need dollars to function. That's why the euro dollar is such an important thing. And you know, that's my friend Tom Luongo uh, uh, made a very early point of noticing that. Anyway, so the Fed's pulling dollars in. The world is dumping dollars. And as long as we keep sucking them up efficiently, the price of gold will remain stable and go up but if the vacuum gets unplugged and those dollars are floating out there and i go well geez i have more dollars than i need because and by the way these dollars really literally get made right i'm i'm a central bank in asia and i own a treasury and i get a coupon and that coupon is in dollars and i've got those dollars and i'm like well the fed's not vacuuming them up now the vacuum is broken what do i do with them well i buy gold and gold starts to go up. So if that Hoover or Kirby or whatever your favorite vacuum is uh, breaks, then gold will have those big spikes like we had December 3rd. Now, I'm not saying that the Fed wasn't doing their job that night, but I am saying you're right. The market must go higher because if it doesn't go higher, hear me out, if it doesn't go higher, that's because the Fed is sucking dollars up too harshly and will cause a depression, which will be cured with printing more dollars, right? And if they don't suck up dollars at all, you have hyperinflation, which is cured with gold sucking up the dollars. Gold is the vacuum cleaner if the Fed isn't. So if you do it just right, gold will go up little by little in an orderly fashion. The bricks will be happy right? Gold's going up and they own a lot of gold. The U.S. citizens will be happy because they won't even know the fact that their standard of living is being sucked dry. And the Fed will be happy because they've done their job. So yeah, gold has, unless they're creating gold, unless they have figured out a way to manufacture gold, number one. Number two, unless the East and West overnight heal and trust each other, that means nothing happened in Ukraine. That means we give them all their money back. And you have, these things can happen. It's like a Berlin Wall type of thing. But we haven't even built the Berlin Wall yet, Jordan, right? So, so unless those two things happen, gold must go higher in an orderly fashion, or you could have something like a World War III or a depression. Yeah, that's it. You're right. Yeah, now, getting to the technicals, I mean, this is so fascinating uh, for me because – the, you know the the 2001 to 2011 that was pretty orderly i mean you you didn't have vertical moves like you had in the 1970s so so that was orderly but vince the problem now is the technical setup for gold is so damn powerful that now i mean this is a whole nother conversation a whole nother episode where we could talk about you know how high can gold go if this, with the stock market keep going up but G given everything that's going on now that you're talking about all these factors that are keeping gold above 2000 very similar to what happened you know when we had to go off the gold standard but right. if you if you throw onto that fire gold outperforming the stock market or outperforming the 60 40 portfolio like you throw that on top of that and you have this super bullish technical pattern uh gold, gold's going to double in like a year like when that happens so i okay. i don't I don't, I mean, I'm not saying you're wrong about the orderly move, but I'm just saying no. that there's a big problem because if, 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 and when gold starts outperforming the stock market, 60, 40 portfolio, gold's going to fly. Like it's really going to fly when that happens. And it's happening at the time when gold technically is, it's ready to go. I mean, it, it it's ready to go vertical. Okay. Yeah. You know, that's, and that's why this conversation is helpful for everyone who's listening I'm telling you, you know, I, I, I'm trying to convey to you what the government's plan is, right? And and unless I'm in the boardroom and I know how panicked or not panicked they are, I'm saying it's going to happen in a slow and orderly fashion, like 2001 to 2011, right? Um, and, and, and there's another reason that it happened in an orderly fashion there. They created GLD which was another sponge that allowed for the price appreciation of gold at a capped rate that they did. Now, that's 
my feeling, and it's right. Uh, now to to take now to take my position for this, you know, fake argument, fake meaning we agree, but we don't. We you know, gold's going to go up orderly. That's that's what I feel is going to happen because I believe the government's going to do it right. And I believe there will be spikes on occasion where they drop the ball and pick it up again. Now, 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 I'm here now, you know, as a student listening to a technician say the formation is extremely powerful. It doesn't argue for a slow and orderly rally as long as we stay above X level, whatever that level is. And there are other very big picture indicators that would auger in more unprecedented flows indicators like the 60 40 portfolio again underperforming relative to gold indicators like the gold market catching up to the s p and you know i hear those things and i say yeah that shit makes me want to change my mind but i'm not changing my mind because my bias is i don't want the fucking world to end <laughs> you know but all kidding aside all kidding aside when but, I but, say no, sorry, you, I'm no, a, sorry to hold on, sorry to interrupt. No, but I okay, go ahead, go ahead, because I I agree with part of what you said, but well, um, I'm going to tie it together. You know, okay. the answer is in between the two of us. You know, I say to you, slow and orderly with occasional spikes. You say to me, uh, very powerful, and I say, you know what? We say together. Well, maybe it's slow and orderly with uh, a little bit less slow and orderly than I think, with a lot more spikes than I think. You know, so so we could have, you know, uh, uh, put it this way. I think they're going to let it get out of control once in a while. But there are factors that are factors that are, you know, you bring up that are importantly different now versus 2001 and 11. The world didn't hate us then. Right. Number one. Number two, GLD was created during that time frame. We're killing the COMEX this time. The COMEX is dying. So you're losing other ways to express or soak up that gold uh, demand. And, you know, of course, you have the technicals now showing what, you know, really is, really, really is a uh, a cup and handle, a powerful cup and handle, which, you know, uh, you've demonstrated, and I've asked you about before, and, you know, 13 weeks above 2,000. Like, so how can I look at you and say, Dude, you're totally wrong. It's only going to go up in a slow and orderly fashion with an occasional spike. I got to be saying to myself, well, I'm not sitting in the boardroom. Fundamentals don't mean shit. Correlations don't mean shit. It's between what I see, which is flows, and tentacles, which is what Jordan is saying. So the answer is slow and orderly with more spikes than I probably am prepared to deal with. And I want to finish that by saying, you know, Citibank came out with a report couple of weeks ago and Citibank is notoriously not bullish gold notoriously and they're a big big player they're not small they're one of the original banks that was involved in the uh in the uh, Fort Knox gold being loaned out to be shorted and they said while we think gold can you know they're not they're not ones to get you hyped to be long okay they said while we think the price of gold can drop to 19 and a quarter 1950 over the next say six weeks we think that the price of gold can easily average above the new all-time high, number one. Number two, and we think if any of these situations gets worse, meaning the Middle East or the financial stuff or or uh, or China's demand, we could pop the $3,000. And then they said, if that wasn't enough coming from these guys, which like, you know, they're the guys who just... They're, they they try to kill you if you're long gold. They said, given the chance between a two hundred dollar move higher or a two hundred dollar move lower, we would have to say for the first time and probably forever that a two hundred dollar move higher is not something that they think can't happen anymore. And so, gold's be coming to be let off the chain, and you know, uh, uh, when Citibank says something like that, I have to be. Uh, I have to be, I have to question my conservativeness. How's that? So yeah, maybe we're going to go up a lot faster.
Yeah, I guess one comment and then one follow up question for you. My my comment is, I mean, I I don't disagree with you that much, but I think like the start of this new secular bull market in gold, I do think it's going to get a little out of control because of what I already said. Like, I think the beginning, this because if you if you go back to two thousand one, you, you you know it, the the gold stocks actually moved huge when gold was only moving a little bit at the very beginning. Like gold, it's slow and steady. I really I don't see that. I I think. I, again, I think the especially when whenever gold starts outperforming, you know, the stock market, the sixty forty, I I see that that move is going to like they're gonna they'll say oh it's a, it's gonna go a little vertical and they'll you know they'll step in and knock it back down when they can. So um, let me let me ask I, you. I don't. Yeah, yeah I, I guess you know that that word salad aside. I guess simply put, I I do think that. It, the, the beginning of the secular bull market, it's not going to be steady, like the beginning part of it. Okay, of, okay. Because so, of all the factors. But I guess my my follow-up to you would be, and I'm guessing your answer, so the question is, is this secular bull market that's coming, is it going to be more like the 2000s or the 70s? And you're probably, and you're probably thinking the 2000s which is better because we want it to be like the 2000s because right. it's, it's going to be easier to make money right but i would actually lean towards you know i don't disagree with much of what you said but i just think because of market forces and now you have the bond you know you have the bond secular bear market thrown in i think it's going to be more the 70s is a better analog okay l l i mean i think the obvious answer is it's if I say the 2000s and you think the 70s, well, it's going to be in between those two. Yeah, right. God forbid if it's the 70s in percentage term, because we'll be at World War III, really. Because that'll be us with, with all of our things in place to keep the dollar steady and gold down. And if it does that, we're done. So obviously, it's going to be in between what I see and what you see. But based on your conversation, you think it's going to be midpoint closer to what you see. You made a comment about about this is twice you said this today the sixty forty portfolio and I want to I want to draw your audience's attention to it. In November, I was looking for a technical level with all my big picture concepts to give me to know when the macro guys would get involved, and I usually use moving averages for that. Uh, but you had mentioned that the Fed, the November thirtieth settlement, and I said, ah, that's where the big money will come in, and they did come in. And they've been liquidating ever since, and the market has stabilized above 2000. That's good. The reason I want your audience to, to hear that is because you're talking about the 60 40 portfolio, and the 60 40 portfolio is um, the next, uh, what's the word, signpost? It's the next moment where if the 60 40 portfolio starts to do worse than gold, then you're going to physically see the way I see it behaviorally. People are going to say, well, fuck, I'm going to go 60 stocks. 20 bonds, 20 gold. You're going to start to see that. And that's kind of like a, a Zoltan Pozar thing, you know, 60, 20, 20 instead of 60, 40. And you're going to see that potentially, to your point, greatly accelerate. You know, it'll be hard to stop two tons going into a one ton paper bag when it all comes in from your own country and it hasn't come in from the country yet. So <clears throat> I think. The reason I'm bringing this up is because you were so right about 2009-20 in November that I'm now looking at the 60-40 portfolio. The only thing I want to add to that is there is a uh, – if you were to compare – this is this is a, a, an indicator for your idea. If you were to compare volatility between the bond market, U.S. Treasuries, uh, and gold, over the last 30 years, gold has been a more volatile asset than bonds. Now – Traders like myself think of volatility as neither good nor bad. It just is. But the more volatile a bond asset is, a store of value cannot be volatile. The reason this is important is because this year, for the first time, probably like ever since they've since they've started manipulating it, gold now has lower volatility than bonds. That's, I think, the early indicator that your 60-40 idea might really be uh might really be something to hang on to. And I'm I'm going to look at it. Do you have a chart that you use for that? Yeah, well, I I I had someone construct a total return for bonds going uh -huh. back a hundred years pr from the ten year Treasury note. Um, yeah, so it's it's forty percent that, and then sixty percent the S and P five hundred, and it includes dividends, so it's total return. So it's my own data series, 
And if and I I had this in a couple videos I did last week, but if if so gold divided by the 60 40, it's it's it actually bottomed at the end of 21. It's gone up a little bit, but not like it's, it hasn't been an impulsive move. Now in the last four or five months or so, it's been trying to break above. There's a moving average I use. It's been trying to break above it, and it hasn't been able to. It's kind of rolling. Looks like it's rolling a little bit back over because bonds are rallying and the stock market has this great breakout. But that's where we are. I mean, it's actually it's actually bottomed and it's gone up some, but it hasn't moved above this moving average. Um, and, and by the way, even if you look at the late '60s, the same thing happened. Where even though it's kind of artificial because we know the gold price was fixed, but it bumped up against this moving average a couple of times. Then it before it really broke through. So, right. and I also I, I also uh, plotted. The Barron's Gold Mining Index against this because that's one gold stock index that has data going back really far, and the uh, you know the last six or seven years in gold stocks looks pretty similar to how it to how gold stocks looked in the you know mid to late sixties. So, um, but I, yeah, that that's again that's like a whole nother video. But yeah, I I think I, I I mean gold against the stock market is one, but then gold against the sixty forty portfolio. Um, yeah, for obvious reasons. Uh, right. and so I, I think when gold can break above that moving average and do it convincingly, um, then that, you know, that's like a signal of what you're talking about that. Okay. The macro guys are now favoring, like, you know, now we actually have to have gold exposure. That's, that's, that's funny. It's, you know, that's not funny. It's, that makes complete sense. And again, I'm going to, I'm going to corroborate that from, from things that I've seen over the past year. Once upon a time, the gold market was traded on the bond desk. It wasn't traded with the other commodities. Gold wasn't a commodity; it was money to them. And you know, I got—I I, I didn't trade this way, but I worked for a bond guy who who explained that to me. Like he would see he was trading bonds, and he would always ask, "Where's gold?" Before he did his bond trades, and because gold and bonds were the stores of value that compete with each other. Now, over the last twenty years, nobody gives a crap about gold. But what I noticed in the last year is that the relationship, the trading of bonds is being tied in with gold, whether it's inverse or direct, but the volatility is moving in tandem. And so what I'm getting at is, as you said, stocks may be killing gold in terms of the relationship, but what really matters is the total overall return of a portfolio. And the 60-40 portfolio may be the... Uh, may be the the mile marker or signpost that we need the next trigger just like 20 was and i say that because because of what you just said plus i know i know as much as a human can know that the bond guys are trading gold now and that means they're aware of it and that means it ain't going away so yeah i mean could be a disaster a good disaster for us anyway so you're wait let me ask you a question is this part of your concept about uh, you know, you're saying the late to mid to late 60s. So you think this is like a mid to late 60s thing. The miners aren't doing well. Gold's doing good. Sleepy, low inflation, relatively speaking. And then it catches fire in the 70s. Is that is that part of your your? Analogy? Yeah, I, I, I think so. Uh, I mean, the, the miners did better in the 60s. But even if you, you know, the, the mining indices, um, if you look at since the end of 2015 i mean yeah they've, the last couple of years have been terrible but they've still trended up since that point but actually here's a couple of things i i think you go back to the mid to late 60s the miners were the only thing that you could buy like if you were concerned about the economy or inflation and actually that was true until 2005 because you you didn't have the the gold etfs i mean that's a whole nother episode but because you know subscriber emailed me about something and like that was my answer and i was like oh well actually gold was you know it wasn't financialized or securitized until the mid 2000s um but by any anyway yeah back to the mid to late 60s so yeah the i think the performance with the, the miners then um it's actually similar similar to kind of how gold is performed because the miners were like a gold proxy then because again you couldn't buy anything like you couldn't buy gold there, there weren't tips there were you know you know about all these things it was basically if you wanted to make like an inflation protection 
investment or you're negative on the economy, like miners were the only thing that you can buy. So in and their their valuations, like they must have been trading trading at like 25 times cash flow, whereas now they're like under 10 times cash flow. So basically back um, then there was nothing competing with them. Now we've got all these new financial products since then that right. even if they're well run, they're not going to get attractive uh money. Right. I mean, I, I you know, my, not until gold is in a secular bull market. And right. then uh, and then it'll be more like the 70s, I think. When you when you had some, you know, tiny, tiny juniors and tiny companies where they went up like a thousand X. So I I do think it's gonna come to that. But I another thing is like given how poor uh, how the relative performance of precious metals is terrible right now. Like you're looking at, you know, silver against the stock market is like trading close to an all-time low. I mean, these gold stock in indexes against the stock market, like they just broke down from like an eight-year base. But if you look at there's whether it was the late sixties or the early seven, like the the chart, the the rate, the, the the relationships, the ratios were were the same. Like if you I like I did this in one of my updates, like just look at history in like 1968 or 1970. There's some point where the relative performance of precious metals was fucking terrible. Like the exact same it is now, but like that was right before like the probably the greatest buying opportunity of all time in precious metals, you could say. Like it was right before shit was about to hit the fan. So it's it's another there's just so many similarities to that. And then given everything we were talking about at the, you know, at the beginning of this episode, you know, where I'm realizing all the things you're talking about, hey, this is actually what happened leading up to going off the gold standard. You mean the France thing? The France thing right, right. is the China thing and the Germany thing, everybody wanting their gold back? Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. not because, you know, because of the markets are so much bigger now and there's far more players. It's not exactly the same, but it's it's like, it is a real no, no, eye-opener. It's, it's exactly, a real discovery. Dude, it's exactly the same. And what I mean by that is the, 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 the how it transmits is different. You know the 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 flavor of the ice cream is different, but it's still ice cream. They want the gold. They don't want the dollars. That's what's happening. It's just a different they, and it's a different speed. You're right. That's what's going on. This is the my so to 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 bring this home for what you're saying because I'm having a little bit of an epiphany as well. And just one, one more. Saying, sorry to cut you off for a second because another important thing. My total return on bonds. When, when I divided that by the CPI, like that broke in 1965, you know, interest rates started, bond yields started going up. That broke in 65, just like it broke in 2020. So that's a that's another powerful indicator. Like the bond market broke first before right. everything else did. But yeah, I just want I to, just want to say the there. charts are paralleling the events in the biggest picture way. I mean, you're looking at big picture charts, right? And I'm yeah. looking at big picture events and my secular map is 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 paralleling your uh your secular technicals for lack of a better word yeah right i'm with you well and a, a buddy of mine like 20 years ago that's what he told me when i was studying charts he said you gotta look at charts but then match that up with fundamentals and what's really going on in the market because you can't i mean these are all tools you have to look at multiple tools right. you can't just be like oh charts don't mean anything i'm a fundamental guy or I'm a charts only guy, it's, especially in the, you, you know, with everything in the gold market, like there's, you can't just rely a hundred percent on a chart. Like you'll get just whipsawed, just right. like crazy. Right. You need to have like, you know, it's, 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 if when you see something like, like the conversation we're having, you're saying, I see a chart that tells me that the next move higher, if it comes, when it comes will not be gradual, but more likely to be explosive and impulsive. And you're looking at my events that I'm saying, and you're saying, this is showing that uh, the de-dollarization concept will be more like the 1970s going off the gold standard. You know, going on to the gold standard for them is going to be like going off the gold standard for us. Yeah, that's. I, I think that's right. I'm with you. Okay. Any uh, anything else we got to cover, or anything else you want to mention that we didn't cover? No, not unless you have fifteen minutes. <laughs> no, no, we're good. I think we covered it all. So yeah, I'm walking away from this conversation with another data point. You need to share that chart, please. Uh, the sixty forty chart, because I, I want to see it. And you I, know, I, I I posted it on Twitter. If you, I did post. Uh, I tweeted it. 
Oh, oh, okay. So, but I want to see it in this video, right? I need okay. an updated version. Yeah, I'll, no, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll plop it into this video. That's something. Uh, is it? Is it in your newsletter? Is it in your, uh, your communication? I'll look for it there. Yeah, I was in the. I'll, I'll send it to you. I'll send it to you. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. Except you know, I, I have, I have uh, the uh, Gold Fix Substack, and uh, for uh, watchers of the Daily Gold. There's a 30% uh, discount for life for anybody who wants to uh, subscribe to that. I would encourage you. And uh, if not, then uh, I'll see you next time I see you. All right. Yeah. Sounds good, Vince. I didn't even have to ask you to give out all your uh, inf you're so, contact you're so, info. And <laughs> you're so well dressed today. I can't, you know, I can't, you know, folks, he usually has pajamas on while we talk. <laughs> Now and now he's, you know, silk robes. Actually, you know, the guy just, you know. Oh, I, I have a question for you. A quick question. Uh, if I know you don't want to make a recommendation, but uh, is there a level, generally speaking, that would make you want to uh, be more aggressive in buying miners now? More aggressive, not less. Meaning, you know, does it have to pop five percent for you to want to get in? Does it have to drop five percent? I mean, well, I think gold going above twenty one hundred. I mean, it it really depends how. No, no, no I'm um, talking about miners. I'm talking about miners. I'm looking at miners now. I bought some miners, and I'm I'm trying to figure where. Look, I bought some miners, and I'm asking myself: Do I buy the next dip, or do I buy the next rally? You follow? Are we near the bottom, or do we have more going? And that's why I'm asking you this question. I I feel like we're in between. I mean, so, I, I I feel like if if miners get more oversold like you right. know they d decline another five to ten percent and then looking at my breadth indicators i mean they were very oversold a couple weeks ago but if we get if we have another leg down i think i would buy that move because the breadth indicators will probably blow out and you know we always get a rally after that happens the right. other important thing is i mean if if we do get a move in gold to 24 or 2500 like the next move like if we get that kind of a move and miners are where they are here and now like you're going to get like a a 2016 2008 2020 covid recovery so there there is like we're not quite there yet but we are approaching a potential setup where you could see miners you know go up like 100 percent in six months like that type of move again we're not there yet but if we get more oversold and gold can have like a move to 24 or 2500 um then you could you'll get one of those types of moves in miners so ideally another another leg down that gets us oversold followed by a spike in gold should take miners yeah. could take miners along with us for the ride yeah yeah that okay. would be a significant move um, okay yeah and and it's interesting because i think in the last i don't know like six nine months or something like that uh valuations in miners are going down so it it it's it seems like behaviorally people are really giving up on the sector. Yeah, yeah, that's because good. The the, the yeah the valuations based on the charts that I'm looking at, and you know some of the data that the banks produce and all that. I mean, unfortunately, it's not as easy as just looking at the S and P 500. You know what what are what's the the PE ratio? Um, you have to piece together various historical data. Mm -hmm. But I I mean I especially for like mid mid tier miners and also juniors th they are around like all time low valuation levels okay all right so that's good to know so i'm going to be comfortable with the position i have and i'll be on the alert to buy a dip but i'm not going to buy strength in miners unless i see it following a gold rally that's my takeaway right. from this right okay right. so i'm comfortable with what i have i'll probably buy a dip and I won't buy a rally. I won't buy into strength unless it's accompanied by a strong rally in gold. Got it. That's what I'm going to yeah. do. Yeah. I think if we get that strong move above 2100, where gold is going up in real terms, um, the miners will really fly. They're in that position because they're hated. The, you know, the valuations are nearing record lows. And that's when they have the most leverage. Like when when they're really oversold, or when gold breaks out. And so the, be the beauty of where we are here and now is um, 
you know, miners are really oversold and gold is in position to break out. So I think at some point in the next 12 months, they could have a huge move higher. Right, right. So the minor move higher would be slowly at first and all at once. If gold gets impulsive, miners will reluctantly and then probably really catch yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. They're in I know everyone's going to be talking about it, but I think we should mention it too. I mean, I know that you've mentioned it. Um, you know, Drucker Miller bought Newmont and, uh, and Barrick. But how much did he buy? I mean, no, I know not, it's not exciting lot, for lot. people, but no, no. I think I think the more significant thing, and I think this is very significant. People don't really know them too much. Not too many people know them, but Elliott Capital, Elliott Management, Elliott is um, is uh, uh, well, one of the best funds in the world, and uh, they're buying. They just announced this, so this is beyond Drucker Miller. Okay, so Drucker Miller could be, like you said, Drucker Miller could be buying just a little bit, a parking spot, you know, just like what B- B- Buffett did. That was completely disappointing. But yeah. Elliot is buying assets. Now, Elliot is a is a, an activist manager. So they will go to, and you're going to love this, Elliot will go to a down-and-out miner and say, we want this property, and we'll give you cash for it. And the miner will be like, sure, and they'll take the property. So I think owning smart management and miners is the way to go now more than ever. And if you had money with Elliot, you would do well as well. The point is, Elliot doesn't get in on a lark. They've already researched it, and they've probably come to the same conclusions that we have. Yeah. A billion dollars, not a little amount. A billion dollars. They they could could almost buy the whole mining sector. I know. I know. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Well, I mean, what's going on with NVIDIA? I mean, that'll be... When we get into that real bull market and gold is going vertical, that will be gold stocks. I'm not saying it's going to be in the next couple of years, but at some point. Hopefully we're lo- we're alive when it happens. Yeah. <laughs> and hopefully there's not World War Three. Vince, thanks so much for coming on. Uh go to uh Gold Fix on Substack if you want to follow and subscribe to Vince's work. And I'll send out the uh discount code to everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on. Right. And, uh, yeah, that was great, people. Vince. Talk to you again. Thanks. In the next month. All right. Thank you for tuning into the Daily Gold Podcast. For more interviews, editorials, and analysis, log on to thedailygold.com. And for premium coverage of precious metals and the best junior mining companies, visit thedailygold.com forward slash premium. Premium.